Is teaching an art or a science? Well, I know more about science than art, so let me start with science. The whole enterprise in a science is to describe the natural world. In biology, it's living organisms. In chemistry, it's the composition of matter, and so on. Education is different because the point there is not to describe the world as it is. The point is to change the world. You want education to change kids. They should know more and be able to do more after they've been to school. All right, so I'm already concluding that education is not a science, but can science help in any way? Sure. There are lots of professions that are not themselves sciences, but that use sciences. Think about medicine or architecture or civil engineering. And note that it's characteristic of these fields that you create something that's going to change the world, make it more like you want it to be. In medicine, you want fewer people to suffer from a disease, so you create a vaccine. In civil engineering, you want people to be able to cross a river at a certain point, so you create a bridge, so on. Okay, but how do these fields actually use science? Two ways. First, you might use principles from basic sciences as you're constructing the thing that's going to change the world. So the civil engineer who's planning a bridge will use knowledge of physics and material science to make sure that the bridge will stand and can carry the projected traffic. So educators would presumably draw on knowledge from psychology, for example, about how kids learn and grow and relate to one another and so on. Okay, that all sounds nice, but it's not so simple. The problem is that most of what we know about how kids learn comes from laboratory studies. And when scientists do laboratory studies, they like to examine just one factor at a time. For example, if I want to know whether, say, repetition helps memory, I might compare one group of people who hears a story once with another group who hears it five times. And I want to be sure that repetition is the only difference between the groups. I want to make sure that they don't differ in motivation or in how much attention they pay to the story. So I might pay everyone in my experiment to be sure that they're all motivated, and I might do the experiment in a quiet room to make sure that no one's distracted. It's probably old stuff for you. Scientists like things to be controlled. The problem is that classrooms are not controlled like laboratories are. So what I learn in the lab might translate perfectly well to the classroom, but it might not. So looking through scientific journals for findings that seem relevant to the classroom does have a big advantage. It's inexpensive because you don't have to do new research, but you really can't be sure that the science is actually going to be applicable. Now you can get around this problem by doing research in classrooms instead of in laboratories. But this turns out to be pretty hard. First, parents and school administrators are pretty reluctant to have scientists come into schools and basically experiment on their kids. Second, it's much more costly to do this research. And third, you gain the advantage that you're doing the science right in the setting you care about, classrooms. But as we said, classrooms vary a whole lot. So the odds that you'll actually find the effect that you're looking for, that really goes down. Okay, so that's the first method. Draw on science to inspire your practice. But wait a minute. The kinds of things we've been talking about here, building bridges, creating medicines, you can do that without any knowledge of the science that actually underlies what you're doing. For example, I mean, there are bridges still in use today that are well over a thousand years old. They were built long before people had any formal knowledge of the physics that underlies their construction. Same is true in medicine. Quinine, for example, was used to treat malaria long before anyone understood how it worked. Now, if you didn't use science to build your bridge or pick your medicine, what did you use? Well, you administered a medicine, and if people got better, you stuck with that treatment. If people didn't, you tried something else. And I'm sure you see the problem here. I mean, people use bloodletting, for example, as a treatment in cases where it certainly was not helping. And they did that for a very long time without seeming to notice that it wasn't helping. The problem there was that they weren't really being systematic enough in keeping track of whether or not the treatment was doing any good. And that's the basis of the second way that science can help in education. We have a lot of methods, statistical methods, methods of experimentation, that were developed in the basic sciences that we can use to evaluate whether or not something's working. So in the first method, you use what you know from basic sciences to inspire how you're going to build your bridge or design a lesson plan or whatever it is. In the second method, you start with the bridge or the lesson plan, and it's been inspired by whatever, and you use scientific methods to evaluate whether or not it's helping. So those are the two basic methods by which fields like education can draw on basic sciences.
But there's still an important distinction to be made here. When we talk about using science in education, people often draw an analogy to medicine. In medicine, we use basic science to tell us about how the body works. So in education, we can use basic science to tell us about how kids learn. But the analogy is flawed, I think, because in medicine, we expect that there's going to be one best treatment for strep throat. Bodies all work the same. But we shouldn't expect that there'll be one best way to teach reading that will be ideal for every child and for every teacher. Different kids' minds do have some things in common, but learning is just more complicated than that. Science is not going to tell a teacher exactly what to do in the classroom. All right, well, if that's true, what will science do for us? I think that what we know about how kids learn and develop and interact and so forth can suggest boundary conditions. I mean by that things that, if you ignore them, will likely lead to trouble. For example, suppose you think that someone could acquire a skill without any practice at all. That's just probably not going to work. Providing practice for a skill is a boundary condition. Another example, most kids benefit, and, and benefit a lot, from explicit instruction in letter sound correspondences when they're learning to read. So providing that instruction is another boundary condition. Notice that this doesn't tell you how to implement practice or how to implement teaching letter sound correspondences. It just says that those things have to happen. So I call these must-have principles. In addition, sometimes scientific results suggest more specific ways that you can implement those must-haves. For example, psychologists know a whole lot about the most efficient way to time when practice should happen so that you get the most bang for your buck. I call these could-dos, things that you could do that will probably help with achieving one of the must-have principles. So let me offer a different analogy. Rather than education is like medicine, let's say education is like architecture. In architecture, there are certain must-haves. An architect must respect the laws of physics, the properties of the materials at hand, or the house that she designs is going to fall down. Likewise, there are standard rules of thumb and techniques to ensure that these principles are being met. If you want to put a window in the middle of a brick wall, there are standard ways that you can ensure that the wall won't collapse in the space created by the window. Those would be the could-dos in architecture. But notice the must-haves and the could-dos don't tell you what the house is going to look like. The must-haves are boundary conditions within which there's a huge amount of room for variation, and the could-dos are tools that you could use to help you get there, but you don't have to use them if you don't want to, as long as you respect the must-haves. So, is teaching an art or a science? Well, it's definitely not a science. I've sort of skirted the art issue. But if you take art to mean something that's wholly beyond analysis, I'd say it's not an art either. I'm arguing that teaching is somewhere in between. Like an architect, a good teacher knows some fundamental findings from science, but then also uses creativity and ingenuity to go beyond any strictures that science can offer to create something wholly original, functional, and enduring.